Hi, welcome to Stories of Art. My name is Karel Huidekoper and today I want to have a look at this wonderful painting by Frans Hals, known as the Laughing Cavalier. It was made in 1624 and you can find it in the Wallace Collection in London. But before we start, let me remind you that you could of course like these videos by clicking the little thumbs up icon or if you don't like them, the thumbs down icon. Either way, I'd like to know. And of course, you could subscribe to my channel. This is free, it's easy to do. All you have to do is click the little subscribe button at, and then there's a little bell button that appears and you click that as well, because then you get notifications every time I post a new video. But let's get into this painting. And for that, I'm going to get out of the way. This painting is now known as the Laughing Cavalier, which isn't exactly a good name for it, because of course, you have to remember that this title wasn't given to it by the artist, by Frans Hals. To him, this was just a portrait of a man who was apparently 26 years old when he made this, because that is what it says in the upper right corner. Instead, the title was given to it once it had arrived in England and was displayed for the first time in Bethnal Green Museum in London back in 1871. Back then they called it Portrait of a Cavalier, and 17 years later, in 1888, it was displayed at the Royal Academy, and then it was called the Laughing Cavalier. It was owned at the time by Richard Seymour Conway, the fourth Marquess of Hertford, and would usually be in their townhouse in London. That house contained a magnificent collection that had been accumulated by various generations of the family and had been inherited by Sir Richard Wallace. He was likely an illegitimate son of Richard Seymour Conway, and Wallace expanded it even further. Now, his widow died in 1897, and she left the entire collection and the house to the British state. And that's where the museum is today. But as I said, it was in England that they came up with the name Cavalier and Laughing Cavalier, which, if I have to be honest, is not a very good title. I mean, it sounds better than Portrait of a Man, but it's not a Cavalier. And possibly more importantly, he's not laughing. You see, a Cavalier can be seen as two things. Someone who is a cavalry man, and he's not dressed as one, so there's no reason to assume that he is. And the other thing is a supporter of King Charles I during the English Civil War. But he clearly isn't one of those because that was decades after this painting was made. The only connection to the Cavaliers that I can think of is that they were described to be wearing more colorful clothing than their opponents, the Puritans, who wore mostly black. And of course, this man wears very colorful clothing. But the more important part is the laughing part of the title. As I said, he's not laughing. He's not even smiling. If we zoom in on his face, you can see that clearly. Although from a distance, he does seem to be smiling, but that's because of the upturned mustache. And there might be a little twinkle in his eyes. So who is this if he's not a laughing cavalier? Well, the short answer is, I don't know. Nobody does. His name is lost to time. All we know for sure is that he was portrayed by the most eminent portrait painter of his generation in Holland, Frans Hals. Now, Hals looked something like this. He was born in 1582 in Antwerp during the conflict between the Spanish crown and the Low Countries. This was an 80 year long conflict where what started as a rebellion eventually led to the north splitting off from the south of the Low Countries. Originally, Antwerp, where Hals had been born, sided with the north but was captured by the Spanish troops in 1585. And this meant that little Frans Hals, when he was about three years old, with his family and along with thousands of others, fled to the north and settled there. In the case of the family of Frans Hals, they settled in Haarlem, which is a city that has a namesake in New York, but this is the Haarlem in the province of Holland. He would grow up and become a painter. Well, first an art restorer and later a painter, and he made mostly portraits. That's because there wasn't much of a market for religious painting in the city of Haarlem. The city had actually confiscated all art that was considered too Catholic at some point. So portraiture was the safer bet. And as it happens, he was very, very good at it. So good, in fact, that even the rich merchants from Amsterdam would travel to him to get their portraits made. And the market for portraiture was very good. Lots of newly rich people wanted to be immortalized. Because even though this was a period of warfare, Holland thrived economically. The city of Haarlem was for a long time the richest city in the area until it was eclipsed by Amsterdam, which in a few decades transformed from a small, barely noticeable city to the biggest port in the world. And if you ask me, the man we see in this portrait is an example of the upcoming merchant class. Because what we see here is a confident and obviously wealthy man. 
who may not be laughing, but I'm pretty sure he's quite content with himself. And we see him dressed in elaborate fabrics that were painted with such vigor and precision that they formed the true joy of looking at this painting. So let's have a closer look at those. There's this collar he's wearing, made of a lot of different layers of white lace, which look expensive by themselves. But then we see this black shiny cloth that is woven into different patterns and that's just sort of a sash wrapped around this coat he's wearing of a black material that is embroidered with all kinds of stuff. We can see little bees, arrows and these strange looking shapes that some have described as flaming cornucopia. You know a cornucopia, the horn of abundance that is usually seen in mythological paintings and all kinds of food and other riches come from it. In this case there are flames coming out of it, if it's a cornucopia at all. And then there's this shape that I would think is a caduceus. Now it's tempting to see all kinds of meaning in these embroidered shapes because they are so prominently displayed. And since we don't know who this man is and we are curious, they may give us some sort of a hint or two, if not his name, then at least tell us something about his life. So what can we deduce from bees and arrows? Well, in some cases bees are related to love. The idea is they bring the sweetness of love in the form of honey, but they can sting as love when things go wrong. Of course, they are also just simply insects, so why would they have any meaning here? Well, that's a good question. They could just be little bees. But then there's these arrows. And of course, arrows are weapons, but also can be seen as the arrows of love, usually shot by Cupid. And then again, all of these things could just be part of a stitched pattern of fabric, and perhaps we shouldn't read anything into it. But then there's the caduceus. That's a staff with wings entwined with two snakes, which you should not confuse with the rod of Asclepius. You see, that's a rod with a single snake curling around it which has become the symbol for the medical profession. Now this is a different thing. The caduceus has wings and two snakes, and we often see it carried by Mercury. The story from mythology is that there were once these two fighting snakes, and Mercury saw them and threw his staff in between them, and they became harmonious around it. And because of that, it is associated with diplomacy, or this sort of fast talking to convince people of something needed to sell them something. And Mercury, being the god of trade, carries it so it's more or less a symbol of trade. And in this case, there's even Mercury's hat or helmet on top. And that may be significant because everything about this man says that he is a rich young merchant. But let's have a look at the rest of the painting and let's zoom in on these cuffs and the lace and the way they were painted. It's just such a joy to see these things up close. Frans Hals was famous for his seemingly easy and quick brushstrokes. It, it looks as though he made this with these very quick, confident little strokes that become a very precisely painted picture when you take a little bit of a distance. And everywhere you go on this painting, if you zoom in, you see what looked like very precisely painted things become these loose brush strokes, like this shiny black fabric stretched across his belly or the buttons on his sleeve. And frankly, that is still the reason people so enjoy the work of Frans Hals. Maybe you can imagine that when Claude Monet went to Holland and saw paintings of Frans Hals up close for the first time, he was very much inspired. So because of that, maybe it doesn't really matter to us who this man is, but doesn't stop us from speculating. For instance, Peter Biesboer, who is also an art historian, noticed that this not laughing cavalier resembles a man in another portrait by Frans Hals. And that is this portrait of Tieleman Roosterman. It was made 10 years later. And if you ask me, yes, they could be the same man. And what's also notable is that Roosterman was a wealthy cloth merchant. And here we see him wearing just about the most expensive fabrics that were fashionable in the 1630s. Black was the most expensive color at the time, and he's wearing what seems to be black velvet. So could they be the same man? Well, of course, we can't be sure, but it's fun to speculate, isn't it? But even if we don't know who this is, it will always be one of the most spectacular portrait paintings that I know of. And of course, it's best to see it in the flesh, so to speak. It's always better to see these things in real life. And in this case, you're in luck. It's in the Wallace collection and it's a wonderful museum and it, the admission is free. I think it was at least the last time I was there. So all you have to do is head over to London. But before you do that, a gentle reminder that you could subscribe to the channel. And of course, I'd love to know what you think about these videos. So let me know in the comments. And I'd like to thank you very much for watching. See you again soon.